Here we are. Hi. Hello. Hi, Ramya. Hi, Pasana. Hi, Ramya. Hi, me. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to our um, Giving Tuesday conversation with uh, Dr. Ramya Ramanat about um, her most recent book um, titled uh, A Place to Call Home, Women as Agents of Change in Mumbai that will uh, transport us into the uh, city of Mumbai and to live uh, the lives of, of um, uh, the women in one of the communities um, there. Um, uh, but by way of introduction, I wanted to uh, give um, a bit of back, uh, a background about um, our guest um, and um, uh, and start from there. So um, Dr. Ramana is um, an associate professor at DePaul University in Chicago. Uh, she chairs its international public service degree program. Um, her research spreads um, um, over uh, three continents, draws on uh, di disciplinary perspectives in organizational behavior, urban uh, so so sociology, planning, uh, anthropology, and political science. Her publications focus on the behavior of international and domestic non-governmental uh, organizations in the context of their interactions with government agencies, other NGOs, and their in intended beneficiaries. Dr. Ramana um, <laughs> teaches courses on the management of international NGOs, sustainable international development, uh, cross-sector in in interactions, and policy implementation. And in the years prior to her ad, ad, academic career in the US, she helped um, start a microfinance institution in Southern India um, and worked in housing finance and development agencies in both urban and rural India. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in economics and master's degree in social work, both from India and a PhD in environmental de design and planning from Vir Virginia Tech. Um, so welcome, um, Ramya. We are thrilled to have you here. Um, I also wanted to introduce um, Upasana Saha, who, who's um, Shadi Guest Program Officer based in Pune. Um, she um, is always so gracious to stay um, uh, late uh, in, um, in her time zone to be part of these conversations. And so thank you and welcome. Thank I'm very you. excited for that. <laughs> Um, so Ramya, you um, uh, come with such a wide background, which is the reason why I'm so excited about this conversation and to kind of um, see how you can help bring your uh, background to bear um, in, in, um, uh, with us here. Um, in your book, A Place to Call Home, um, uh, you d discuss the role in shaping urban development in one of the largest slum um, uh, sites in, um, in Mumbai. Can you set the stage for us? Can you tell us um, what's happening um, when you first meet the woman? What, uh, what, are, uh, what is the si situation? Wow, so thank you, me. Thank you, Vasna. Really appreciate it and really excited to be here. I think this would qualify as my first Facebook Live event. Um, but thank you. Um, so, well, uh, to answer your question, uh, me, um, a lot was happening and had happened when I first met, um, when I met the women for the first time, which was nearly 18 years ago. Um, so brace yourself for a rather um, heavy stage setting. Uh, I shall try my best to bring this to life. And of course, happy to clarify further, should you feel I'm falling short. Um, I had known of some, but not all of the 120 women whose work and words form the core of this book. Um, I, so this was a decade ago before, um, this was a decade before I started collecting data for the book. So the first time I met them was back in 2002, while they lived uh, on the fringes of Mumbai's only national park. Now this is a park, uh, when I say a national park, I'm referring to a park that spread over 10,000 hectares of land. Um, and they were living in an area around the park referred to as the buffer zone of the park. Now the park is nestled in the Northern parts of the city and extends into the much uh, larger metropolitan region of Bombay, uh, as in Mumbai. 
uh, actually Lonely Planet's travel guide to India describes it um, as a hiker's delight. It's made up of hills, valleys, open spaces and lakes. In fact, the park's two major lakes supply Mumbai's drinking water. Um, so when I first saw their homes in the park, they were recovering from a massive demolition drive led by the state government. Uh, the demolitions were the product of a high court case uh, fought between an environmental rights NGO uh, and a housing rights NGO as in a non-governmental organization. Now, the environmental rights activists won and the court ordered the demolition of the homes. We're talking about 75,000 to 86,000 illegal hutments. But according to state government rules, the homes of those who could prove their residence in the city on or before a cutoff date, and the cutoff date was the 1st of January, 1995, were to basically remain untouched until these folks were offered alternate housing. Now it was these 22,000 eligible households that lived in eight settlements, uh, some of the most dense settlements on the park's fringe areas that were to become the focus of the research that informs this book. Now, after waiting for 12 years in limbo, that is not knowing about their housing futures. So their homes have been demolished. Demolition started in 1995. They waited for 12 years. Um, until 2007, before the women and their families began their slow journey to their new um, developed slum resettlement site that was built on a former stone quarry. Now this was land, this is a, a stone quarry, a former stone quarry spread over 45 acres of land and is located about 10 kilometers, so roughly a little over six miles from the park. And it's a rather unusual site with respect to its location. It is situated in the heart of the city uh, of uh, Mumbai in actually a posh suburb. And most resettlement sites, if they're ever built, are, um, are situated in the far off fringes of the city. Slum dwellers tend to be pushed away from the city center to its far off unseen yeah. suburbs. So these residents of the park slums were making their move to become legal owners of a small cookie cutter 225 square feet apartment unit in the site. So this was a unit comprising a living room as you enter and then a kitchen and a toilet. Mm -hmm. That's it. So the site had not developed according to actually promises made by the NGO that had fought for their housing rights. Um, well, to be fair, this wasn't an NGO-led project per se. This is a public housing project developed in cooperation with a private real estate developer who was also the land's owner. And of course, the NGO that basically mobilized and organized the residents in the slum and took on the task of designing the site. Mm -hmm. Now, I re-entered their lives uh, at a time when the women began the process of relocating and settling down. Uh, what was obvious to me was that this was a site that was far from ready for occupation. Mm -hmm. It had not developed as promised in the design that was shared by the NGO. Um, the residents were all randomly assigned units. So not everyone in the same slum or neighborhood in the slum was resettled in the same apartment building. Mm -hmm. right? um, so we're talking about 200 apartment buildings spread over these 45 acres of land. So, um, so at least for the first two years uh, after they were resettled in 20, uh, 2007, there were hollow elevator shafts, no drinking water in the kitchen faucets, no designated space to conduct business in, um, no open spaces, no designated playgrounds, no net designated markets or hospitals or cremation ground or cemetery. Um, and of course, it's quite another thing that these things have organically come up in the site. But to this day, there's no designated um, school, uh, there's no designated place of worship um, and all of the other amenities that was promised. Mm -hmm. So this new site is by all accounts, as you rightly said me, Asia's, Asia's not Mumbai's largest resettlement site. So while I met some of them periodically over the years, uh, between 2002 and 2012, uh, the data that informs this book was collected from August of 2012 to December of 2016. Mm -hmm. So my big question to them was, how does a woman create or recreate a sense of place after being involuntarily displaced? 
So for that was fundamentally. Years. Yeah. Say that again. For 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 twelve years, nonetheless, it's not like they 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 were correct there immediately. They had to go somewhere else for twelve years. Precisely. So uh, some of them stayed amidst amidst the rubbles of their home. But yes, you're right. I mean, many of them were um, rendered sort of homeless, so to speak, but found accommodation in different places uh, across the city. Some went back home uh, to their native villages and towns. So it was focus group discussions with 100 women and personal interviews with 20 women that constitute the source of information that informs the bulk of the book's six chapters. Mm -hmm. So when I first saw them, coming back to your question, me, uh, women were struggling, but were working hard to make this new place a home. So, and I, of course, wanted to capture this phase because I intuitively knew that this is a phase in their residential lives that will soon be forgotten. So um, that's your big picture. Um. <laughs> well, what, what, what fascinates me about the way that you describe this new settlement site is that it was built for people, but not necessarily for humans, in that in that, in that it had somewhat of the components, um, as you would imagine, people needing to, um, in order to live, but not really for a human, for a thriving human community to live in with like all the social interactions, the economic um, 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 activities, mm -hmm. uh, the educational um, learning for all of those things to actually happen in that site. And so having said that, um, I like you, you. You just said um, it seems like when you meet the the woman, the the women, they're in that moment where they're trying to um, create a home of of these places. And mm -hmm. you did, did discuss throughout your book this concept of placemaking um, um, quite a bit, and the central role that these women play in moving this idea forward um, in these slums. Can you define for us what place making is and, um, and why is it so important? Why is the perspective of these women so critical in the pro process of, um, of, of, of place making? So how much time do we have, me? <laughs> as much time as you, <laughs> as you <laughs> so, um, this is This is of course the title of the book, right? Uh, uh, a place to call home. So mm -hmm. I, I better define this, but uh, I, I'll start with a very simple definition. I think uh, simply stated, placemaking is the process of creating quality places that people want to live in, people want to work in, people want to play and learn in. So what is critical about placemaking is that it's a process. It is a means to an end. Mm -hmm. um, the end is the creation of quality places. And so the definition keeps shifting. So people know and understand what quality places are when they are in them. Um, so it is more challenging to describe the characteristics sort of hypothetically. Uh, so, what, uh, so we all define it differently. Uh, different places and different attributes of a place uh, evoke a sense of attachment to the place. So mm -hmm. to make a place means different things to different women meanings mm -hmm. that change in response to uh, new needs, new circumstances. So placemaking unfolds over time. Um, and without knowing the significance that places represent for different people, policymakers and implementers um, will find uh, it difficult for one to describe why some consider a place special or not so special. Um, and secondly, they won't know how to plan and design new places or even repair existing places uh, towards greater functionality and livability for all its mm -hmm. residents. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it might help perhaps to, I'm just gonna pull up um, uh, the electronic sort of uh, my ebook version of my book to sort of give uh, bring this to light. Sure. So I've just pulled it up on my screen here. So I might um, sort of, uh, so this is about, uh, this is chapter two. So it's uh, uh, roughly about page 26, 27 of the book. So this is the case of 19 year old Leela. Now this is the demographic that I know Shadika deals with, right? So this is 19 year old Leela who was brought up in the slums in the park, in the park slums. 
Now, her, her parents had migrated to Mumbai from the northern Indian state of Uttar Pradesh, which I know is another state where Shadika works. Mm -hmm. So their parents had migrated um, in the late 1980s to, uh, to Mumbai and ran a grocery store from the lower level of their self-built two-story home in the park, in the park slum, right? So she recollects her, her home with great nostalgia. So I'm, she's part of a focus group discussion and she, she's talking mm -hmm. about her life in the park slums and she talks about it with great nostalgia and, and is all smiles. She said that hers was a home of five rooms. Uh, she says uh, each room had a door, to the, side was a, to the side was a kitchen, the other side there was a bathroom. And she says, this, these are her words, she says there was everything. Um, when we were about to shift, I did not want to move. Mm -hmm. The area she came from had schools within walking distance. Mm -hmm. uh, there were actually several private schools within the park uh, and many municipality run schools close to the park's fringe areas. So she mm -hmm. remembers her friends, her neighbors, and in doing so, basically said this. She said, if someone were to fall sick, they would come and ask, how are you? What is it? Mm -hmm. They would just come to the door and check up on us and leave. And then she goes on to say, like, she gets really excited, right? She says, where my house was, over there, there was a tree nearby, and in front, water would flow. There would be, uh, there would be breeze. I would take in a lot of cool air. I would feel very good over there. And I had a friend and she would call me to play. If I didn't go, she would pull my cheeks and drag me. <laughs> she would ask me why I didn't come. I miss sitting together and studying, right? Now, what's interesting about this, that it was Leela's parents who upon migrating to the city had worked over several years, nearly two decades to make this place a home, mm -hmm. right? They could afford to. Mm -hmm. They were residents. Um, they were residents of an infrastructure-rich slum located in the lower elevations of a hilly park. So the residents in her neighborhood had, over many years, negotiated with the city's complex and, might I add, corrupt bureaucracy to set up a well-consolidated neighborhood. Now, mm -hmm. if this were a regular slum, as in a state-recognized slum. Um, 10 to 30 proximate households could come together and qualify for state provided basic infrastructure. I won't get into the details right now, but I can tell you is that her household and those in her neighborhood had effectively bribed the municipality and negotiated, and I would call it mm -hmm. negotiation, not bribing really. They negotiated with local politicians to procure water taps, electricity, sewer, mm -hmm stormwater drains, community baths and latrines, paved roads or toilets. So to Leela, a place to call home was defined by togetherness, the freedom of movement, by play and proximity to nature. Yeah. Now that, that defines her attachment to a place and in fact circumscribed her perception of life at the new site. But this is just one story, me. Uh, so, I don't know if we have time, but I can share yet another story, which is not so rosy. Um, and that's the story of Pariniti. You know, she's a 40 year old widow um, with five daughters. Um, and she, for her, the slum means something different. Uh, mm -hmm. Her husband had passed on before she had moved to become a legal owner of her apartment unit. Um, she was born in Bombay and lived in a rental unit with her sick alcoholic husband in the park slum. Um, his alcoholism as well as pressure from her mother-in-law caused her to take up a job as a garbage picker, separating paper and plastic bags, um, discarded into municipal garbage dumps in upper class, upper middle class residential neighborhood near the park. Mm -hmm. And she made money selling um, the sorted items to a kabadiwala, which is a waste collector. Now she earned about 10 to 20 rupees a day. So that would translate as uh, how much, my God, uh, bad math. Uh, so we're talking about 14 cents uh, to about wow. 27 cents a day, but had no control over her earnings. Uh, so she basically told me I would work and get 10 or 20 rupees. I would hide two or three rupees for my belly to eat on the sly. Mm. So undernourishment combined with health hazards of waste picking and regular beatings from her husband actually led to two failed pregnancies. 
Mm. Um, so roughly 10 years later, and with help of a gang of four goons, um, as in rowdies or thugs, uh, Pariniti became a de facto owner of a small parcel of land in the park slum. Uh, she mm -hmm. owed the goons about 7,000 rupees, which is about $95 for this small parcel of land in the slum. Uh, the bamboo shack she built on this parcel remained in an unfinished state for nearly 14 years. And mm -hmm. for all of the remaining, which is pretty much the remaining years that she lived in the slum. Now to help pay for this parcel of land, Pariniti began working to deliver drinking water to other mm -hmm. households in the slum. So the idea that women don't exploit women is sort of <laughs> incorrect, they do. Um, so she would fill water from a municipal stand post downhill and carry these water to the water drums. You're talking about 10 to, lit uh, 10 to 20 liter water drums placed outside the homes of those whose, um, uh, the families who did not want to, you know, take the trouble to go, to go downhill to fetch sort of water. So through all of this, uh, her ailing husband never loosened his grip over their lives. He would insist that the door be kept shut, supposedly to protect his wife and his five daughters from prying eyes. Mm -hmm. So Pariniti told me rather ironically that uh, she felt safer outside than she felt mm -hmm. inside her rickety shack. Yeah. So for Pariniti, who is a Dalit, a member of the schedule, uh, scheduled caste category, the extent of marginalization was so severe me that a move to an apartment at the resettlement site, uh, at least for now, is the move to a place where she felt a whole lot safer. Sure. Where, where she opened and closed the door to her house at her own free will, where she mm -hmm. did not have to pick garbage and sort through other people's garbage. Right. Um, where she did not have to deliver water to other households, to other mm -hmm. women. Um, she made a place in the slum, uh, but was not necessarily attached to it. Mm -hmm. uh, because for her, that place evoked memories of a life with few pleasant memories. Sure. So, so, so it means to make a place means different things to different women. And um, so place matters. Um, and so that's a sort of prolonged answer to your question, but yeah, I mean, like what, <laughs> what's fascinating about about the these two stories is that um, a lot of times when when we try to do when we try to provide any kind of human service like housing or the work that we do here at, at Shadiga could be considered um, human services as well. We get lost a lot in the technicalities of it, right? It's like, what is the square footage that a household needs to have? What is the, you know, like, how are we going to build the pipes and the hydraulics? Um, we at Shariga, like, are concerned with, with deadlines of our grant making and the reporting and all that stuff. But then on the other side, mm -hmm. on the impact side, rarely do we hear what, you know, the impact that Shadika had on me was the great reporting formats that they sent every year, right? And it's not like <laughs> the amazing hydraulics of this new um, apartment that was, that was given to us. The meaning that, that, that these women um, highlight in, once they feel like they've made a place is like you were saying, like that emotional human connection that they have to the place, mm -hmm. that um, attachment that they have to, uh, to, to their place. And, 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 and I just find the, the, the two perspectives um, so interesting because they're so polar opposite of, mm -hmm. of one another. That's right. Yeah. Um, Upasana, I know that that yes. that you had a couple of questions as well. Yeah, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think like uh, I have like, you know, I haven't had the chance to read your book completely, but like reading your ch reading just the chapter five has just given me quite a vivid idea around um, how you unfolded some of the, you know, practical challenges um, that often get lost in very technical and very, um, you know, uh, I would say uh, conceptual uh, terms that we use in our social development sector, but I, it was very important for me to see how you have narrated um, some of the in-person experiences of these hundred, hundred women who you have 
have interviewed um, to uh, to hear their journey. So, and what role were they able to really play in uh, each of in 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 their um, in uh, in their limited scope and the opportunities that they had. So, you know, I would love to hear like. Uh, you know, in the vision, in the entire, in the entire context where women have tried to improve the site functionality in different ways, where you have also given the example of uh, how women were able to advocate for, uh, you know, having safer space uh, for recreation, uh, you know, able to even uh, find uh, alternative options for livelihoods and talk about freedom of mobility. So, you know, in reference to that, like, I would like to hear from you how important important is it like for them uh, you know the um, to to really the women's ability to chart her own life how 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 well were you able to see that when you spoke to some of uh, some of the women who you closely uh, you know uh, like for almost from 2016 uh, from 2012 to 2016 mm -hmm. that's like a long time so yeah i would love to hear that it is um 2012 to 2016 in bits and pieces, I would go whenever I could head to India, right? So August 2012, yes. then in the Decembers, I would lead study abroad programs with my students and would sneak away time to spend, um, to collect data. So um, so that's a great question. And I, I will try to not say too much, but say enough keeping in mind, I think the demographics that Shadika mm -hmm. is dealing with. Um, so, uh, so I won't refer to all of the book's key findings, especially in terms of how uh, women envision the site developing um, and the process is ongoing. It's still happening as we speak. Mm -hmm. So uh, to the question of is the, uh, is the vision of women important? Um, and the answer, of course, is it's phenomenally important. Um, the suggestions uh, actually that they've offered me um, symbolized an emerging desire for change. And mm -hmm. for me, most interestingly, it defies prevailing methods for livelihood generation. And I would say defies prevailing methods of life itself mm -hmm. that are prescribed by external stakeholders, including NGOs and donors and governments. Um, and so broadly stated, they are calling for a full and continual engagement of, of them as affected women in planning, designing, monitoring, and evaluating resettlement and rehabilitation processes. And I'm positive that some of these suggestions translate beyond just resettlement and rehabilitation policy. I think they apply equally for healthcare, for education, mm -hmm. um, and of course for livelihood generation, right? Um, so, do, so you mentioned uh, ideas of safety and employability. Now, uh, you are your target population at Shadika is the unmarried young adult women, right? So for the unmarried women, uh, who participated in this research, um, the way forward entailed some yet to be identified entity in the resettlement site, taking the lead in formally petitioning the government for a police jockey uh, or a checkpoint in the resettlement site, uh, something, uh, a checkpoint that is, um, uh, that is sort of, uh, that employs a female police officer, right? Yeah. That was important for them. They also envision that an agency like the NGO that mobilized and advocated for their housing rights to allocate a gender segregated space for recreation and skills training. And they visualized that a similar entity could actually work to convince parents uh, that skill building workshops could lead to financial use. And for me, this was fascinating because um, on many levels, and I'll explain a little bit. Now, as they persuaded each other for the need for safe spaces, Upasana, they are asking for safe spaces for recreation. These yeah. women recognized that they were not the only group denied such spaces. So they were not calling it a woman only problem. They mm -hmm. rationalized the uncontrolled rowdyism among young men uh, and the resulting fear to be related at least in part to the absence of sanctioned spaces like playgrounds mm -hmm. and gardens in the site. So their request for segregation and why I find this interesting and is that their request for segregation reinforces existing patriarchal norms, right? Uh, by which I mean that they 
these women are saying that remove us from public spaces uh, and because removing women from public spaces actually vests responsibility for handling harassment chiefly on the women themselves, right? Yeah. Because it's like, get yourself out of public spaces because you can't take care of yourself, right? Correct. It's so, again, the protectionist approach, which we keep applying. Exactly. But unmarried women in this research found practical virtue in it. They're saying that we need this uh, as protection and regarded it actually as a crucial component in winning greater independence from parental control. And we need to listen to that, right? So they are saying parents who believe that the site is the safe host of practical skill training that will bring future employment opportunities are more likely to encourage their daughters wider aspirations, including uh, working outside the domestic domain, right? And so this suggestion mm -hmm. from the women contradicts the thrust of many donor, government, and NGO efforts that operate in the belief that discrimination is deeply rooted in cultural assumptions mm -hmm. about gender identity and relations. Yeah. So interventions, therefore, um, aim to raise gender awareness through media campaigns and mobilizing community support for non-traditional norms, right? So I'm not denying um, and the value of such efforts, but the reflections of these never married young women makes a case against such awareness and consciousness building programs. They argue instead for tangible resources to help mm -hmm. counter parental restrictions mm -hmm. and harassment from community males, both of which were identified as limiting their future aspirations and employment options. They are like, make money related arguments because parents will listen yeah. to that because apartment living is expensive. It's taking a financial toll. So I think it's uh, it's smart, right? It's practical, it's yeah. to the point. Um, so the other thing I wanted to say, um, and I'll stop with that, is that the women are also asking, so this is kind of ironical and really sad. So they are asking for the inclusion of their names in the title deeds to the apartment unit. Now in a twisted, sad irony, the NGO that fought for the housing rights forgot to fight to have her name included alongside that of her spouse in the title deed to the apartment unit. Mm. So as such, in the event of a divorce uh, or a separation or widowhood, the title does not automatically transfer to her name. Absolutely. But she has to fight an uphill battle with the city's bureaucracy, um, a whole lot of hurdles to prove her right to ownership of the apartment unit. So that's yet uh, another, I mean, there are several suggestions they give, right? They're talking about more on-site jobs. They're asking for more collective spaces to, to mingle, to chit chat, to play, to laugh. Um, they're, as I said, they're asking for gender segregated spaces for recreation and skill building. They're asking for more support for already existing informal social networks among them like they have informal savings and credit groups, they call Bishis in Maharashtra. Uh, so these are savings and credit associations. Uh, so they're giving circles, the equivalent of giving circles in the US. Um, so they're asking for more support from the government and from donors for this. So these are some suggestions, but I'll stop now because I want you to read the rest of the book as well. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm yeah, that's some. Um, what what I love about what you're saying is that, um, which is like you rightfully pointed, is is a challenge for um, especially NGOs working in this sector, um, like Sh Sharika, who um, um, stands for Gender Justice in, in in India. It is a challenge to fully um, do what we say, which is let the girls let the young woman decide for herself what her life ought to look like when those decisions may not match exactly how we would like them to behave you know and so um from our perspective and so what i appreciate about what you're saying is that is the ability to improve um in 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 the in the for the women in your book is the disability for them to decide what's 
what they want, even if it's tainted with patriarchal norms and, and, and other things that um, in the West, we might have an instinct to want to uh, debunk and fight from the, from the root, you know, but, but um, and so it poses that, that question and that challenge of what does it really mean to let these women decide what their homes need to look like in order for them to be able to do the things that they deem important to uh, mm -hmm. themselves. Um, which actually leads me into, into my next question for you. And it's um, uh, in, in your job, I know that in your, in your book, I know that, that you spent quite a bit of time and there's a lot of sections when you transcribe word for word exactly what the women are, are, um, are saying and, um, and how they express their thoughts and their opinions. And you and I have had um, um, uh, uh, a few conversations now about gender um, justice and what it takes to get there. Um, and one thing that you and I agree on is that it starts by listening to the women, which you do so beautifully in this, in this book. Um, but you also mentioned the importance of listening to the why. Why do these women say the things that they say? And, and what does that inform us about, um, about uh, their condition, but also their wishes for themselves? Um, and, 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 and just last week, coincidentally, my blog also explored the why of our mission. What is it that Sharika is in the work that, um, that we're doing? And so, I, 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 and and I know that that you've touched on it um, over your la the, uh, the the last few questions of of this why and um, and this myth that women are these perfect ideal creatures that are free of biases, free of prejudice. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that and what and what you found when you paid attention to the why? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you. Um, appreciate you reading the book, uh, me and both Vasana as well. Um, what I uh, meant by that is, as in, so the, so the question, if I understand it right, you're saying it's not just important to listen to the women, but as we have spoken before, that it's also important to figure out why they're saying what they're saying. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, uh, me, is that one needs to avoid essentializing. Right. It is no longer. Um, it's no longer sufficient, um, and I think it's no longer acceptable to produce a theory of change solely within an essentialist or universal collective experience. Uh, so, so a theory of change uh, that says this is our, this is our theory of change for a woman. This is our theory of change for a girl. Um, I think it's it's no longer acceptable to do that. So to ask why she's saying what she is saying is to consider women as whole beings, mm. to recognize that not all women experience their womanhood in the same way. Many women um, face multiple forms of oppression and not all women are rendered powerless, <laughs> right? In fact, many women manage their multiple identities and challenges well and lead fulfilling lives. Yeah. So in this book, I have pushed this idea a bit further. And I'm suggesting that individually women experience their womanhood and various interlocking oppressions differently in different places through time, mm -hmm. right? So what is oppression and intolerable in one place may be a privilege and a joy in another. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so maybe I should I that. an applaud to that. Oh, <laughs> it is so important. Can you can you say that one more time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, this has been said before. I'm not the first person saying it, but I think what the book will share with you. So, 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 what is oppression and intolerable in one place? Maybe a privilege in another. So, what is? what is unbearable in one place and unfathomable uh, in one place could actually over time be a privilege in another, be an opportunity in another, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that's what I said. Is that the repeat you wanted? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so um, so I, I'll actually give you an example. I'm, I'm going to try pulling up uh, yet another example, if that's okay. Because yeah, I completely. 
<laughs> I'm trying to bring the voices of women forward and not my own voice. So, um, so I remember I told you that uh, these women were forming themselves into informal savings and credit groups. They were giving money to each other, right? So this is informal associations called bishis. Now, what's interesting about this is that um, these groupings are particular among ca upper caste Hindus, a Hindu mm -hmm. women. Uh, to some extent among the Dalits for sure, but excluded from such groupings uh, were the Muslims mm -hmm. um, or, and residents originally from Uttar Pradesh and Biharis, uh, which is the state from, uh, from the state of Bihar and other non Maharashtrian women uh, who call this resettlement site their home. So except for small talk about each other's spouses and trips to the evening bazaar and the ration shop, these women, I'm talking here about the, the UPIs, the Biharis, the Muslims, all of them lacked the outlets of the Bishi women to share their thoughts, right? So, but the move to Sangarshnagar, which is the resettlement site, had brought other forms of pride and empowerment to some women, spurring them into employment they would have never considered otherwise. Now, this was true for Shaista. So I'm giving an example of a 35 year old mother uh, she's a mother of eight children, ages six to 20, right? She was a Muslim, um, is a Muslim of the Sheikh community of Uttar Pradesh who had migrated to uh, Mumbai in 1995 after losing her firstborn. Now, um, so she tells me, she's describing her life and I'll share a little excerpts of what she's say, telling me. She says, we lived there as in in the park slum for 15 years. And then she says, now I have to work. The light bill, the, main, the light bill refers to electricity mm -hmm. bill, the maintenance costs. How can a man do it all alone? I never thought how difficult it is to earn until I started working two jobs. Yesterday, he, which is her husband, brought home 100 rupees. My daughter went uh, with the money to buy vegetables and some other groceries. And that is it. It was done. In one day, all that money is gone. Mm -hmm. So her husband was self-employed, uh, peddling little bottles of perfume called Itar uh, from a leather bag uh, through the streets of the city's business district. And occasionally he planted himself on street corners. So on good days, he would earn about 100, 200 rupees, not enough to meet the family's needs, right? So this led Shaista to gather her courage and do something she has never considered before, which is doing outside domestic work. So she swept, she mobbed, she dusted clean toilets and hand washed clothes for nearly for nearby two homes, earning about 4,000 a month. So work as a domestic helper was uh, highly sought out among women in the resettlement side, despite poor pay, despite unstable tenure and lack of safety or health provisions in these jobs. But the proximity to home and the short four hour workday appealed to Shaista. Right? So she defines this as empowering. Mm -hmm. We may look upon this as a step down perhaps. So she says, people tell me that I don't look like a mother of so many children. A man who roams in the sun will look older, won't he? She's trying to justify to me. So she says, I take my children to school. I now realize how difficult it is to work. Mm -hmm. He does not object to my, so I asked her, but your husband is okay with you heading out to work, right? So she says, he does not object to my going. He thought I would be distracted. And I told him to come and see me work. So she, he was afraid that she would sort of um, get, it, get attracted to other men, right? So, um, so she says, I told him to come and see me uh, work. I have taken my children to my workplace, she says. They should know, as in the children should know what their mother and father do to bring them up. They come back, they came back home and told him, as in her husband, that mother does this and that the people are real nice. This, she says, is important. So Shasta was thankful for discovering the good people who gave her good money for the work she did and talked about the presence of discreet civility among residents from different states. So she was part of a neighborhood with other Sunni Muslims from UP in the slum. And now the community is all disaggregated. So my point here being is that um, she did not go out to work at the slum. She's going out now and she likes it, right? She was not complaining, but she's definitely um, 
she did not express any problems related to divisions in this resettlement side, but I intuitively know and conversations with other women that such exclusion has diverse, uh, has really adverse psychological consequences. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, there is a perceptible, noticeable differences between Muslims and non-Muslims, Maharashtrians and non-Maharashtrians that have actually been reinforced uh, in, in huge uh, sort of degrees at the resettlement site. So she's basically a not part of the savings group. She doesn't regret it, um, but she says, um, uh, but she says she's cordial to everyone. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of she's living with people that don't share her ethnicity. So there is sort of discrete civility, mm -hmm. uh, but not really a real curiosity to get to know one another and truly live in any so-called harmony, so to speak. <laughs> and I think that that's the mistake that. Um, that we often do in this sector is 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 as much as we say we want to tailor and localize our interventions i think that that often we fall into the pitfall of having somewhat of a cookie cutter model um and and as much as we say we want to adopt and adapt right. um, that work is actually quite um difficult and really re requires discipline flexibility um, which does not um, um, define um, this this sector um, in, in in any shape of or um, uh, or way, and so it does it does re 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 require um, a certain intentionality to be able to go against the grain. Pasana, I know that you have a couple more questions that that you'd like to ask. Yes. Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I, as I remember hearing you uh, really share um, the first story where you've spoken about um, how I, I, can, I cannot recall the name, but like I, I remember where you've spoken about um, how one of the interviewee, like who you, she shared that how uh, she experienced intimate uh, violence, uh, you know, from her husband. And at the same time, she had to live very close uh, in in a very close proximity um, with with the with the perpetrator itself, uh, and she didn't have any place to go. And at the same time, where you also gave another contrast, like you know, where uh, uh, Saida was able to ex uh, share her experience, where she needed a validation about the work that she's doing outside the house, really is uh, something which requires a appreciation from the man who is the ultimate holder of the patriarchy uh, and the ultimate decision maker. So, you know, just uh, throwing, just tying these two examples and also the one of the one of the interesting facts which you told me can has been really, you know, uh, tickling my thoughts, which is how the NGOs, the agencies, uh, despite the, you know, work that they have been talking about the rights, talking about, you know, uh, the dignity, talking about, uh, you know, the settlement uh, that the women deserve. But at the end of the day, there was um, a position where the women could really have to go back to, you know, the same circle from where it started and lose their, um, you know, um, authority over, uh, you know, over the entire struggle that they fought for, which is their place to live. Um, so, you know, so keeping these three things in mind, I would love to, you know, hear more from you. I know just we don't have much time, but then, but still, like, if you could just tell me a little bit, how do these women really perceive uh, the role of the NGOs and the men and boys in their lives? Wow. Um, so I'll try my best with this one. So what we have... <laughs> Uh, what we have today in resettlement and rehabilitation policies, and arguably in many other policy arenas, uh, including in the fields of education, healthcare, economic and gender empowerment, is that NGOs, uh, NGOs are being called on to serve as bridges between what is and what should be. Correct. But in reality, their involvement has not resulted in the voices of the disadvantaged to be represented in any genuine form. And I know this is um, a, a strong accusation, um, but I think one that I really wanted to make. Uh, NGOs have functioned more as contracted agents of the government, as in as the state, 
than representatives of the poor. I did find that many, but not all NGOs, lack direct links or accountability to the effective uh, the affected constituencies that they supposedly serve. Mm -hmm. Many NGOs are strapped for resources. Their mm -hmm. agendas are driven by foundations and donors. Mm -hmm. They manage projects, including resettlement initiatives of the types that I studied on a short-term basis okay. and with highly inadequate research or homework. Mm -hmm. Now this uh, NGO, I, I call it the NGOization of the concerns of the poor. Uh, and, and related transformation of community concerns into time-limited organizational projects. So everything is projectified, is NGOized. Now this has, what, ha what this has done is that it has yielded normative and prescriptive studies and solutions. So it's not uncommon to hear uh, statements like, people should have a home. They must have housing rights. Girls must get educated they must have a right to chart their own course in life. <laughs> now these studies and all resulting practices treat organizations, including NGOs, donors and government agencies, and I would include private firms in it as instruments of capacity building and mm -hmm. social change while actually paying very little attention to the different forms of organizing um, in relation to the life worlds of social actors and the broader context in which these actors are performing. I mean, to give you an example, Upasana, the fact that such forms of self-organizing by the marginalized have and continue to thrive despite and sometimes because of shortcomings of NGOs, donors and government show that a whole lot is going wrong. For instance, the bulk of housing in India is produced not by developers, not by state governments, not by housing boards, but produced through auto construction mode. Mm -hmm. People are building their own housing. So mm -hmm. formal authorized or what you and me call legal housing is unaffordable. And in the case of this book is, at least to start with, is not livable at the outset, right? So housing, which is actually affordable and is built by people themselves is deemed unauthorized and illegal. And women recognize this. They recognize NGOs, donors, government, political parties, all as mercurial actors. Mm -hmm. They will never reject, they will never reject a solution offered to them. They just won't. Why? Because their efforts to lay claim on the right to the city is an uphill battle. So women admitted that in the 10, 12 years that they were waiting for rehousing, they witnessed firsthand how various actors comprising NGOs, state government, political parties, architects, private developers, they were all busy competing with one another. Everybody wanted uh, to get the gold medal, the certificate for having rehoused the poor, mm -hmm. right? And I think this is how NGOs all operate. They all want this certificate that I've done the most impact, right? So what did the women do? Uh, they hedged their bets and they kept shifting allegiances from competing organizations and individuals. So I think, so they are strategic actors and, and the city's sort of the competitive environment in which NGOs operate, in which many private sector players operate, actually compels this kind of reaction, saying that um, because to come to a solution, I, I think problems are addressed, they are never solved. <laughs> so, um, so I think women just... Um, uh, they go after anything, women, men alike. I did not study the men, but I don't <laughs> imagine it's any different um, that they will hedge bets. They'll hedge their bets. They keep shifting their uh, allegiances to precisely those who make promises. Whether that promise is fulfilled or not, uh, time tells them, right? So I don't know if that answered your question, Upasana, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think absolutely that answers my question. And it's really... Uh, get to get that, you know, critical uh, lens uh, about uh, uh, how everybody's at, at the end of the day, um, how all NGOs are also looking at the way of 
coming up with the best solution, but again, just addressing, not really uh, culminating it at the root. So, uh, so, so that's, that's uh, absolutely, I think I agree to that. And uh, yeah, I think uh, my, my last question is uh, one of the favorite lines, which I, which I have been like, you know, trying to remember and talk about uh, with, uh, with, with my friend who I met this weekend was uh, sense making and sense giving. Like I, I think that those those two words are beautiful and like they resonate with uh, women at every stage of their life mm -hmm. and uh, and and it also resonates with uh, like you know when you're talking about uh, the solution uh, so you know if we talk about uh, if we can give the power to the women to talk about it and also how you mentioned if they're able to also think about the why that's when like you know uh, we we get the best uh, you know answer so but you know as we close uh, you know our conversation uh, you know I would like to hear more from you for for an organization like ours um, how should we bring these stories uh, into our work uh, as we endeavor to work with our young women and scholars across uh, the five states uh, in India mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, in, in, and in future wherever we start working? Wow, okay, um, I'll try again. Um, I, I honestly think you're already doing that. Um, uh, but I think, Upasana, I'll tackle this a little differently. Um, I think um, we need more stories um, mm -hmm. about those doing empowerment interventions, those who are intermediaries and implementers of policies, projects, and programs. And I think um, Shadika is already doing that, especially in your, I think your most recent or the, the most recent impact report that I read on your website, you're sharing short interviews with staff mentors uh, with Shadika scholars. So you're already doing that, right? Now, the, at least this is what my reading of your annual report tells me. Um, and the reason I say this is that the best of laws and policies um, and the most um, painstakingly or intricately designed programs can falter and fail if those who deal with putting them into practice are themselves engaged are not themselves engaged and empowered as agents of change, mm -hmm. right? So those are the front line of project implementation. Those are the front lines play a very vital role in women's empowerment. And this can be obscured by the focus on individual women. That is really characteristic of all mainstream narratives of empowerment, you know, pictures of a girl, picture of a woman, and she is empowered, right? So what I would genuinely encourage is a focus on the story of those that do the work to empower. Yeah. So how much power do the NGOs and their frontline workers have to empower the clients they serve? Mm -hmm. How well do they know their clientele? How mm -hmm. do these NGOs organize and mobilize the attention of the girls that they're working with? Do they possess, do these NGOs possess the necessary resources to be able to empower them? Uh, when are uh, these frontline workers most effective and when are they not, mm -hmm. right? Um, and what are some innovative methods uh, they have used and how can such innovations be encouraged and supported, right? So I think Upasana, that the contribution that external actors can make includes clearing the obstacles mm -hmm. from paths that these NGOs are already taking. So that's what donor organizations like Shadika can do. It's, it's, it's supporting places for women to gather, to reflect on their journeys um, and create their own milestones. It's like, mm -hmm. this is when I worked well. This is, why I, this is why I think I mobilized 10 girls today or I mobilized one girl today. And encouraging, so I think we need uh, more stories about what works, why it works, and when it works. And I think I'll really stop there because I know we are at noon, at least noon Chicago time, and it's way beyond our timeline. Correct me? 
I think me is frozen. Oh yes, I think so. I'm sorry, my uh, yeah, my my screen froze for a second. I think yeah. I'm back. No problem. No. Not quite. Yeah, I think uh, there is a little bit of a. Yeah, I think you're stuck. <laughs> She's stuck in a happy stance. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but but I think like uh, that was uh, that was like uh, you know we we you you really did a fantastic you know uh, job just to really walk us through uh, the entire book in such a short time, like you know and sharing some of these remarkable stories, the journeys, uh, you know the the stories of the women. Um, who who you've worked so closely, and um, and it just shows uh, that you know I'll I'll pick up the line that you said that is uh, you know the power again resides in them, and you know we just have to gather uh, what they say, hear what they say, and collectivize and help them to make their journey. So the strength really relies, you know, just uh, goes back to the some the say, three things what they want, what they worked, uh, when they worked and why they need that. So yeah, I think uh, that's, that's a, a very important, um, I would say, uh, point for us to reflect and, uh, uh, and ensure that how we are able to really translate that um, in our program and in our communication with our uh, partners, in our communication with our young women. So, uh, because at the end of the day, they should be the, uh, the voice of uh, the program because the program really um, should be a reflection of uh, the change that they want and the change that they're able to bring. Thank you, Pasana, for, uh, for summarizing that. Uh, Rami, I'm so inspired by your work. I'm so inspired by the wisdom of your words as well and, and, the, and, the, and, um, and the, the stories of these women that you've shared with us today. Um, I wanna thank you, Ramya, for spending your morning with us um, uh, and for sharing the stories of these fearless women um, with our audience. Um, I want to thank Upasana, who's always game for staying extra late on this cool night <laughs> to be part of the conversation. Um, and then I want, to want, I want to thank our audience for watching us. Um, if you're following us on Facebook, on Instagram, or through our newsletter, you know that today is Giving Tuesday and that our goal is ambitious. Our goal is to raise $25,000 to implement our holistic model of intervention in India. Um, with $25,000, we will be able to provide leadership uh, opportunities and skills building, which um, um, uh, Ramya, you so um, rightfully uh, pointed out is, is, is critical uh, for 500 girls and to support seven scholars for a full year at one of our partner sites. Um, and there are a lot of ways for you to give today. You can give it give through our, our Facebook page, on Instagram page, our, our website, our PayPal portal um, to make your gift to, um, um, uh, um, to today and, and, and every dollar counts. Um, so do not think that your gift is too small. Today, your money will be doubled to help us meet that goal. Um, and your donation can really make all the difference in the life of a young woman in India during an, an especially hard year. So please give as generously as you can. Um, and thank you again to Ramya and Upasana for um, uh, being part of this conversation with me today. Thank you. Thank you, me and Upasana. Thank you, me. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Good luck. Bye.